That's what it means. When God called Moses, Moses tried to squirm his way out of it, giving several excuses why he wasn't the one to do what God wanted him to do. I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy, Lord. You got, you've got the wrong guy. You know, I, did, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say, but I did the same thing before having a home church. I spent years, literally years, saying, yeah, you know, God, I mean, I'm not the guy, but I'll, you know, I'll kind of do a substitute thing until you bring the right guy in. And, uh, you know, I'll, you know, I'll do that, but I'm not the guy. I'm not the guy. And I kept saying that I'm not the guy. I'm not the guy. Peter had to learn the lesson in the vision in the book of Acts so he can go to the house of a Roman centurion to preach the gospel. He's saying, wait a minute, these people are Gentiles. I ain't going into them. They're not, you know, I'm not doing that. And he's like, wait a minute. The Lord gives him the vision to tell him, hey, stop calling uncommon, common. Stop calling those things that I'm calling out common or just not worth it. If I'm calling you to go here, go here. If I'm calling you to do this, do that. So what we may feel that's wrong and or crazy and or innocuous could be God using it to further his glory. If it's not unbiblical, but may challenge tradition, it could be that tradition needs to be take a back seat and be reevaluated. In the very least, it's not a cookie cutter approach that applies to everything. God is not us. Therefore, when he does things, we may not understand what is happening at all. Is what it says in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You can't get, you can't touch this is what God is saying. You don't, you ain't where I'm at. If you go back to the Old Testament and you read about the prophets and this crazy stuff that the Lord would be having the prophets do, this is like the stuff that you're like, what is, what is going on here? What is going on? This is crazy. Crazy stuff he had Isaiah do, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, me, Adam do, all this kind of like crazy stuff. Hosea, there's just like Jonah. Like, man, what, what this is what? He was doing it for his own glory. They didn't understand it. We don't understand it today, but he was doing it for his own glory. So Jesus going, see a Galilee, this fisherman area over here. Uh, let's put it into contemporary terms, right? Let's put it into contemporary terms. Jesus comes today, and this is equivalent to Jesus didn't go to the nice suburbs, he went to the ghetto. Some success, some some business people there, because believe it or not, business people in the ghetto. And he went to him. He says, I'm choosing you. Most unlikely place. He says, I'm choosing you. And maybe it's not the hard, hardcore ghetto, but it ain't the maybe it's the soft core ghetto. But still, that'd be the first place you go to find disciples of Jesus Christ. Called to be apostles later on. To turn the world upside down. Yeah. See, we wouldn't do that. Now, another way that Jesus did things outside of the box, out of the ordinary, in those times was that rabbis didn't go looking for students. That wasn't the way they did things. Students came looking for rabbis. Students came and applied to be taught and be a disciple under a certain teacher. You know, Gamaliel, Paul, or whoever. 
They, they, they went to them. The teacher didn't go to them. And here it is, Jesus going to find them. He's hand-picking. You know, students apply to learn under a rabbi. It's very similar to what we have today in college, right? What we do is we apply and spend money to go to a institution of learning to learn under somebody. And sometimes it's someone that we that may have a particular good reputation in a, a certain area. And so we go and we apply to learn under them. Whenever we want to learn something, we apply to learn that. But Jesus did it the other way around. He went handpicking his students. There wasn't nobody going to apply for him. He went and said, you and you. He went looking for those who were qualified. And these were the ones confirmed to be those whom the Father had given him. This is what it tells us in John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And we're going to touch on that, that next week and why we know that that was the case. But Matthew Henry says in his commentary on this verse, I love this, he says this, Christ will have followers. If he set up a school, he will have scholars. If he set up his standard, he will have soldiers. If he preach, he will have hearers. If he has taken an effectual course to secure this, for all that the Father has given him shall without fail come to him. Now you got to understand something, beloved. Jesus is going down on the docks where the sailors are. It's smelling like fish and there's boats all over the place. And there's like we were saying, it's busy. There's all these people and he's looking for two people. He's passing by scores of people. To look for two. Look how he's doing this. He's handpicking them. Dare I say, here it comes, he is electing them from his own hand, you and you. But why not them, 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 and everybody else who were over him? Nope, just you and you. Hmm. See, Christ was on a mission to gather up his people because the full-scale invasion of the kingdom of darkness had begun. It started with the Lord Jesus Christ and his triumph in the wilderness confrontation. We talked about that. It has continued since that time till today. Like right now, we're still in it. Like we're doing it right now in the preaching of the word of God and calling people to repentance and to repent and believe. We're still invading. The Lord Jesus was gathering soldiers for the cause of the invasion of the kingdom of darkness through the gospel. And it's still going on today. And that's going to lead us to takeaway point number three. Takeaway point number three, which says this. We, are, we were saved to learn. We were saved to learn. I want you to notice the first thing that the Lord appoints them to is not a position of authority. That's not what he does. But to a place of learning. There is a double meaning in the term follow me when he says that. He goes, follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. There's a double meaning there. Within that, he means it literally in the sense that they should start walking where he walks with his legs. He's saying, you and you right now, follow me. So he's saying that literally. But there's also the metaphorical call of follow me, meaning I'm calling you not only to follow me after me in my body, I'm calling you to follow me in discipleship and learn from me. That's what he's saying. He needed to make them disciples before he made them apostles. He was calling them to learn more about God. It says in the preacher's homiletical commentary, it is first a call to discipleship and then to apostleship. Personal holiness must precede Christian usefulness. Let me say that again. Personal holiness must precede Christian usefulness. Faith must go before works. So let the heart first be given to Christ 
and the dedications of hands, feet, tongue, and brain will naturally follow. The word disciple literally means learner. That's what disciple means. It means learner. The call to Christ is the call to learn. In this case, they first must come disciples, must become disciples before they can be apostles, which means someone who is a sent one. We know what apostle means? Apostle means sent one. So before you can be sent, listen now, before you can be an apostle or a sent one, you must be a disciple, somebody who has learned something. So in this sense, every, every Christian is an apostle. Every Christian is a sent one. Every Christian is sent as heralds of the gospel and purveyors of the truth. All of us who are part of the household of faith. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It's our job. It's what we do. We as a people, as a race, it's what we do. Luke twenty two forty seven 47 says, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So this is the natural progression. We must learn before we can be of any use to anyone. People trying to run and don't have a message. Right? We see this, and um, we'll talk about this next week, and we go back to the Old Testament of running without a message. No, you don't do that. You gotta have something to say. We must know what we're talking about before we are sent. This is not to say that we are to know things in totality. That's not what it's talking about. Even the disciples, when they were being discipled, were going out and giving the gospel. They were still doing things, but they came, they had to come first to a position of learning. They had to humble themselves and put themselves under someone to learn before they can start running with something. There are people who do that they never get around to sharing the gospel or stand for the truth because they're paralyzed by saying, well, I don't know enough. So since I don't know enough, I'll just wait until I know enough. And when does, when is enough enough? Did Jesus wait until the end of his three year ministry to send out the disciples? No. He had them actively still giving the truth. And sit there paralyzed not to do anything, giving the excuse that, well, I don't know enough, so I'm not going to share the gospel. Or I'm not going to share the truth. I'm not going to do. You know what? That is no different than someone who shares the wrong thing. That's no different. In both cases, you're doing no one any good. So. We need to know a little something. Just a little something. In the very least, we must come to the table with the knowledge of Jesus Christ as the Messiah and what that means. I mean, if you can give that in its simplicity, you're good to go and you can learn and keep learning from there. The problem with people who are in the church today is that that's all they got. They got three. They got John 316 and it never went any further. And it's the most it's the saddest, most pathetic, most anemic thing, which is why the church doesn't have any power. You stay on John 316 for a decade? What's wrong with you? There's no reason why you would think that something was wrong with somebody if they're 50 years old with a baby's bottle in their mouth. And that's how they get their food. That would be disturbing. For a baby, it's normal. For someone who is supposed to be grown and eating solid food, you sitting around and the only thing in your refrigerator spiritually is a whole bunch of milk bottles. Something is wrong. 
That's messed up. That's disturbing. There's something wrong and defective there. You got to go beyond that. You got to know something. You got to become more mature. You got to know something. You have to be growing. You have to be a disciple, a learner. You have to learn. If we are going to elucidate and present the gospel in a way that is convincing to the hearers, we must know the word of God and search the scriptures, which is what the Lord Jesus said. He said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Search them. You need to learn something. You need to learn more about God. We all do. It's just like the title of RC, one of R.C. Sproul's books. Every Christian is a theologian. That's just not some title for some highfalutin guy in a seminary or a college some way. No, it's for every Christian. Every Christian is a theologian. Or every Christian should be. We must be true disciples, ever learning with a truth rooted and grounded in the word of God, spoken and lived in the power of the Holy Spirit of God as a witness of the gospel active in our lives. Beloved, we're on a divine mission. You've heard me say this so many times, and I'm going to continue to scream this from the mountaintops. I can hear my voice cracking a little bit, which is why I wasn't preaching last week. So I still have a little bit of that frog in my throat, but we still are going to keep preaching. We're on a divine mission. We're on a divine mission from God, the God and creator of the universe. The one who has saved our souls and become and became one of us in order that we may obtain eternal life. This divine mission is wrapped up in everything that we do. It should be a consuming force in our lives that sucks us into its beauty and its joy. When we look at the gospel, truth, mercy, self-control, all the rest of those virtuous things in light of scripture as burdens on our soul, there is something defective within us. Either it's an attitude or it's something deeper. We were saved not to be idle or to simply apply things to ourselves and to our lives alone. And that's it. And never reach out to anybody and never say anything to anybody and go in our four walls. And that's it. And say nothing to nobody and just be cool with you being saved, which is the most selfish thing that any one of us can do. We're not saved to be idle. We're not saved to simply apply these things to our lives and to ourselves. It is a part of our divine mission to give this out. All of life is a part of this divine mission. And this calling to this is irrevocable. God knows what he's doing when he chooses. And just because someone doesn't look like everybody else or isn't doing what everybody else is doing, it doesn't mean that they're doing it wrong. Everything must be tested by the word of God. And if they ain't doing it in, in, that's different from the word of God, but as far as doctrine goes, but it's just different because of tradition. Well, maybe tradition needs to change or tradition needs to expand or something. Beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ called Simon and Andrew to a place of mission and learning. He is calling all of his people still today, walking in the most unlikely places and handpicking you and you. It's the same ministry and same call today. So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and he calls and he says, you, will you answer the call? 
May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance and give you peace. Be a disciple and never stop. God bless.